Um, just a reminder that this is the Tacoma Bible Presbyterian Church. We are located at 6202 South Tyler Street here in Tacoma, Washington. Um, on uh, Sundays, our day begins at 9.30 a.m. with Sunday School for All Ages. And we have uh, an adult Sunday School class that is live streamed on um, uh, YouTube. And this morning, in the last couple of weeks, we've been dealing with temptation. You can see uh, that whole series there on YouTube. At 10.30 a.m., we have our morning worship. Uh, this morning, uh, Steve Battiston uh, spoke uh, for our morning worship service. And you can see Steve's message on YouTube as well. And then, of course, on Sunday nights, we're here um, from 6 to 7. As uh, we begin tonight, and just uh, for those of you who have uh, just gotten on, just wanted to let you know that we received word this afternoon that uh, Brandon Davis is uh, in the emergency room uh, down in Olympia. Brandon uh, has been dealing with a serious infection for the last week. Uh, but things uh, got worse uh, overnight and this morning it's during the day to day. And so uh, he's receiving some tests and may have to go undergo surgery here. Uh, we're not sure yet what uh, all that is, but we want to be praying for him. And Becky's asked us to pray for her mother. And of course, we have uh, Stuart and Zona uh, with procedures this week. And then we have uh, the two families in our congregation who have lost loved ones. So. Uh, we have a lot to pray about, um, but uh, before we get to prayer, I'd like to read from Psalm 48, mm -hmm. verses 9 through 11. Psalm 48, verse 9 says, We have thought on your steadfast love, O God, in the midst of your temple. As your name, O God, so your praise reaches to the ends of the earth. Your right hand is filled with righteousness. Let Mount Zion be glad. Let the daughters of Judah rejoice because of your judgments. We are glad. We're thankful for the Lord's work and for his steadfast love. And uh, let us praise him together now in prayer and pray for the needs of our friends. Father, uh, as we bow before you tonight, uh, we are thankful to know that uh, we are all uh, under your tender, loving care and that your eye is on each one of us. Father, we're in different places, really scattered throughout the country at this moment, but Lord, uh, we are one in our presence before you. And we pray, Lord, that your hand of grace would be upon us tonight as we uh, spend this time together in your word. Lord, we pray that you would feed us out of the word. You are our shepherd, and Lord, we are the the sheep of your pasture. And we pray, Father, that you would uh, strengthen us and encourage us and, Lord, correct us as we spend time uh, with the truth of your word. We thank you for the subject before us tonight, and we ask you to, to bless it to our hearts. Father, we also thank you for the salvation that we have through the Lord Jesus Christ. We rejoice in the message of the gospel and we thank you, Lord, for sending your Son to die for our sins. We uh, are reminded of what a comfort that message is for us. And, Lord, it's a, a, a comfort for us in our own lives as we think about our own future. But it also, Lord, gives us comfort in the loss of those who are dear to us. So, Lord, we pray for um, uh, Nancy Lundberg's family tonight and ask you to bless them and comfort them uh, with the gospel and the knowledge that Nancy uh, made a clear and long time profession of her trust and confidence in the Lord Jesus Christ as her redeemer. And Lord, we pray the same for uh, Virginia Nisker's family. And uh, Lord, we pray that uh, her faith might be a comfort to those who knew and loved her. Father, we also lift up before you those in need tonight, and we pray for Nancy Pashaus, uh, Becky's mother. We ask you, Lord, to have your hand upon her. Uh, Lord, you've uh, brought her along uh, a long way, and uh, 
she's had a difficult time here recently. We pray, Father, that you to keep the doctors aware of what her needs may be. And uh, Lord, be with Becky and Debbie as they attend to her. Father, we uh, pray also for Brandon tonight. We don't know uh, really what he might be facing, but we pray, Lord, that you would be with he and Ame. Pray that you would encourage her, and uh, Lord, that uh, her trust and confidence in you uh, would uh, um, buoy her through this uh, experience. And we pray, Lord, that you'll give the doctors a, a perfect understanding as to what Brandon's needs are right now. And Lord, that they will respond according to those needs. We also pray for Zona this evening. Ask you to be with her as she's in the hospital. Pray, Lord, that she will continue to have uh, the right kind of care there. Uh, Lord, we know that uh, for those who are involved in caretaking in hospitals, it can sometimes be tedious. We pray, Lord, that you'd make them patient with her and she patient with them. And we pray, Father, a time there will help to prepare her for her procedure coming up this week. And we pray, Lord, that you'd also be with our brother Stuart, and Lord, that you would uh, prepare him uh, in mind and body and spirit for uh, the surgery that is ahead for him as well. Father, we are so thankful to be able to pray for one another. Um, we know that it is uh, the best thing that we can do for each other. And so, Lord, we lift up one another, uh, even though there are other needs that we have, uh, other needs that are represented by, by those who are uh, with us tonight. We just pray that you would be with each one uh, according to those needs. And we ask you again now, Lord, to feed us out of your word. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we are uh, um, looking tonight um, at Second Thessalonians chapter 1 again. But I'd like to read, first of all, just to sort of uh, get our minds thinking about things from Zechariah chapter 9. So I'm going to start off there tonight, and then we'll go over to Second Thessalonians chapter 1. So if you want to find both places so you can follow along, you can do that. Zechariah chapter 9, and I'm beginning with verse 9. And in Zechariah, the prophecy of Zechariah, verse 9, it says this, greatly, or Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he, humble, mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim, and the war horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow shall be cut off, and he shall speak peace to the nations. His rule shall be from sea to sea, and from the river to the ends of the earth. As for you also, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will set your prisoners free from the waterless pit. Return to your stronghold, O prisoners of hope. Today I declare that I will restore to you double. For I have bent Judah as my bow, I have made Ephraim its arrow. I will stir up your sons, O Zion, against your sons, O Greece, and wield you like a warrior's sword. Then the Lord will appear over them, and his arrow will go forth like lightning. The Lord God will sound the trumpet and will march forth in the whirlwinds of the south. The Lord of hosts will protect them, and they shall devour and tread down the sling stones, and they shall drink and roar as if drunk with wine and be full like a bowl, drenched like the corners of the altar. On that day, the Lord their God will save them as the flock of his people. For like the jewels of a crown, they shall shine on his land. For how great is his goodness, and how great is his beauty. Grain shall make the young men flourish, and new wine the young women. Now moving to Second Thessalonians chapter 1. Here the Apostle Paul is writing to the Thessalonians about the coming day of the Lord. And he says this beginning in verse 5. 
So 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 5. This is evidence of the righteous judgment of God, that you may be considered worthy of the kingdom of God, for which you are also suffering. Since indeed God considers it just to repay with affliction those who afflict you, and to grant relief to you who are afflicted as well as to us, when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. In flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. When he comes on that day to be glorified in his saints and to be marveled at among all who have believed because our testimony to you was believed. To this end, we always pray for you, that our God may make you worthy of his calling and may fulfill every resolve for good and every work of faith by his power. So the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in him, according to the grace of, of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. <coughs> Excuse me, for some reason, uh, after I read the scripture, I, I end up sneezing here lately. But, uh, we pray the Lord will bless our reading from his holy and his inerrant word this evening. When we mark October the 31st, 1517, as the anniversary of the Protestant Reformation, we're focusing on an event that historians chose to identify as the beginning of a movement. The full consequence of that movement, however, those full consequences are still unfolding. We haven't come to the end of the story of the Reformation yet. Although the end may be nearer than we imagine, the point is that the story of the culmination of the Reformation's impact on civilization is yet to be written, the end of the story. We can contemplate and we can postulate exactly when it will come and what it will look like, but until the actual events unfold, it is at best just an educated guess based on experience. And if you go back to those early days in the 16th century and reflect on the expectations of those involved in the Reformation, uh, we can be fairly certain that most of them had no idea where this was all going to lead and how it would end. I was reminded when listening to a lecture the other day by Dr. Godfrey that the students at Calvin Seminary in Geneva used to refer to their diplomas from the seminary as their death certificates. And there was more irony in that than humor. The Reformation, even at that point, was not yet the triumphant cause it would eventually become bringing a new spirit of liberty and truth to Western civilization. Now, when we think of the greater cause of Christ and his church and the kingdom of God and the coming day of the Lord, all Christians entertain great expectations about that day. But the route to those expectations has caused a great deal of studied speculation, especially among theologians preachers, seminary students, and many lay men and women. Basically, as most of you know, it breaks up into three major camps. But there's some overlap into each position. And there are a multitude of nuanced positions on each point within each camp. But despite all these speculative differences, we're all looking forward to this day with great joy and great anticipation. Now, I was thinking of this while contemplating the World Series the other day. And this may seem like a digression, but bear with me for a minute. Also, for the sake of transparency, 
I have to confess being a lifelong Phillies fan. As a kid, like millions of others at that time, I would buy my pack of baseball cards, and I'd try to chew that brittle piece of bubble gum inside of it, glean out all the Philly cards and all the famous player cards that were worth something, and then I'd pin the rest to the frame of my bike with a clothespin, uh, so it would flap through the spokes while I rode and sound like a cheap motorbike. This is more of a digression than I expected. The confession, that confession made, however, here's what I was thinking. When the World Series opens, every fan has his or her idea of how it's going to unfold. Some even have opinions on how each game will go depending on who's pitching and whether they have the home field advantage or whatever. Those opinions and views may even change as the games unfold. But there's one thing I've never seen. When the last out is made and the team becomes World Series champions, I've never seen the fans of the winning team sulking or complaining or depressed because the series didn't unfold according to their theory of what was going to happen. No fan of the winning team is found sitting glum with the losers and saying, well, I thought and predicted it was going to take seven games to win and they did it in just four. I'm so disappointed. No, when the fans go wild, as the expression is, um, they go wild too. The victory is far more important than the fulfillment of anyone's predictions. Now, the Apostle Paul here is taking the Thessalonians, some who have been disturbed by discussions about the coming day of the Lord, he's taking them past all the possible events and all the, the ways those events may come to pass and all the preconceived notions to that triumphant day itself, fixing their attention on the glory of that day when it arrives. To those who haven't known God and who refuse to believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, it will be a day of bitter disappointment and closing judgment. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. But you won't find among those who are weeping should it turn out contrary to their expectations, some post-millennialist weeping because the amillennials or the historic premillennials were right and they were wrong. All that will be forgotten in the joy and in the wonder of the fulfillment of this great day, the security of this great day, when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God uh, and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. But I want to turn to verse 10 because it also tells us that this is the day when he comes to be glorified in his saints and to be marveled at among all who have believed because our testimony to you was believed. We left off at this uh, 10th verse last week. And while we do want to move on our study of Second Thessalonians, I really believe it's important to pause and meditate a bit on this picture. This picture set before us regarding the coming day of the Lord and the believer. Paul says here, on this day, the Lord Jesus will be glorified in his saints. Now, the first thing to be said here is that no matter what we say about this day and about what it means for the Lord Jesus to be glorified in his saints, the experience of the reality will be infinitely greater. No matter what we say, no matter how we try to talk about it, no matter what we bring forward, the actual experience will be far, far greater, infinitely greater. David says in Psalm 31 and verse 19, this is the 31st Psalm and verse 19, 
Oh, how abundant is your goodness, which you have stored up for those who fear you and worked for those who take refuge in you in the sight of the children of mankind. Oh, how great is the goodness that the Lord has prepared and the work that he's done for, for those who take refuge in him, all to be displayed in the sight of the children of mankind. The fullness of that abundant goodness which the Lord has stored up for his own, the fullness of it is going to be on full display on that day, that great day of the Lord. It is Paul who says now in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 9, reading from 1 Corinthians now and chapter 2 and verse 9, Paul says there, I has not seen nor ear heard nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed them to us through his Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. Paul is saying here, the Holy Spirit has revealed that these things are yours through Christ, if you're a believer. These things that eye has not seen, nor ear heard. The fullness of what they are, or will be, will be revealed in that great and awesome day of the Lord. That's the day that you, that Christ himself will be glorified in his people. And on that day, these things will be revealed. In Psalm 66, verses 4 through 5. Psalm 66, 4 through 5. It says, all the earth worships you and sings praises to you. They sing praises to your name. Come see what God has done. He is awesome in his deeds toward the children of men. This is infinitely more than anything we can possibly express. Secondly, it is the manifest excellence of Christ that will be seen in you, if you're a believer, will be seen in his elect on that day. Let me repeat it because it's such an important point. It is the manifest excellence of Christ that will be seen in you. What a wonder that is. What an awesome thing to know that the manifest excellence of Christ will be seen in us. When everything promised to us comes to full fruition in you who believe because of what he's done for you, then the Savior will be glorified in you on that day. You know, at a recent event on the campus of the University of Wisconsin at Madison, some protesters tore a Bible from the hands of a young man who was reading from it and they ripped it into pieces and threw it all around and then one of the protesters of the Bible being read grabbed one of the pages and ate it to show his utter hatred of the word of God. On this day, this coming day of the Lord, when all that the word of God promises is fulfilled, the glory of the despised Christ and his word will shine forth in you, his elect. You will be the living evidence of the reality of all that he has promised. And those who have hated it will be brought face to face with the wonder of it all. They rejected it. They despised it. They wanted nothing to do with it. And now they will see that it is really, it was really the answer and the hope of all. And it will be, re be revealed in you being in the fullness of the joy of all that Christ has done and won for you. The psalmist reminds us in Psalm 1830, uh, Psalm 18, verse 30, this God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord proves true. 
He is a shield for all those who take refuge in him. And you will be the evidence that the word of God proves true. That's why he'll be glorified in you. Peter says this in 1 Peter chapter 1. This is 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 24. The first of this will sound familiar to you. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers, and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. The proof of the truth of what God has done, what God has promised, will be seen in you enjoying all that God has prepared and preserved from you for you from that day forth. But in what does this glory consist? It, it will be manifest, but what will it look like? Well, it will consist in the fulfillment of all that he's promised to those who believe. But let's think about what that looks like. You will be, beloved, part of a vast throng. The number will be stunning. In any era of church history, the numbers may seem small as we look for fellowship with those of like precious faith. But on that day, you will all be present together. This great multitude that God has taken to himself. You recall when Elijah imagined himself to be the only faithful one left, the Lord corrected him and stated that he had left or reserved to himself 7,000 who had not uh, bowed the knee to Baal. The true number was far more than Elijah could imagine. And so it is, beloved. The vast number that you are a part of is far more than you can imagine at this hour. But on that day, when he is glorified in his saints, you'll be a part of that vast crowd, that great number, that multitude that he has saved and redeemed and called to himself. And this will bring honor to Christ and shame to those who have mocked Christianity as the pie-in-the-sky dreams of a few addle-minded idiots or as the white man's religion. The international diversity and unity will be great, and every division of race and color, sex and tribe will be replaced with a oneness made possible in Christ alone. Christ achieves what every idealistic political ideology and humanistic agenda claims to seek but can never accomplish. If men are looking for unity among all human beings, then the place to find it is in Christ because it's the only place it can be achieved. And on that day, it will be revealed. John says in Revelation chapter 7, beginning in verse 9, in the Revelation of Jesus Christ, chapter 7, Verse 9, he says, After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb. And it's in that sight of this multitude that no one can number from every nation and tribe and peoples and languages standing before the throne, singing the praises of the Messiah. It's in that multitude that Christ himself will be glorified. And this throng, giving glory to the Savior, will be represented by men, and women and children from every age of mankind, from the creation to the culmination of it all. 
from Enoch to the last saint gathered in by grace. And this will leave those who have tried to label the Christian faith as an archaic superstition from another age speechless. There'll be nothing to say. What can you say when this multitude is standing before you? There'll be nothing to say as it becomes painfully clear that God has highly exalted the Lord Jesus Christ and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father, as Paul says in Philippians chapter 2. So first, he will be glorified in the numbers and in the diversity and in the ageless witness of his elect. He'll further be glorified in the beauty of his bride. Now, we know that he loves the church. And Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25, Ephesians 5, 25, says that he loved the church and gave himself up for her. Then in verse 26, it says that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. And then in verse 27, he says, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. What a beautiful picture. And the beauty of the bride will be part of what Christ's glory will be revealed in among them. The saints now in heaven await this day when by resurrection or translation will all be changed. And he will, at some point, as Paul says in Philippians 3.21, transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. That day is coming, and when it comes and that change is made, the beauty of the bride will glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. At that time, we will all appear, as Isaiah describes, saying in Isaiah 61.10, I'm reading now from the prophecy of Isaiah, chapter 61, verse 10, the Lord says, I, uh, excuse me, Isaiah says, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord my soul shall exult in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself like a priest with a beautiful headdress, and a bride adorns herself with her jewels. That's what we'll be saying. It's what you'll be saying if you're his tonight on this great and glorious day. Now, all of those who did not heed Paul's warning, and he gave this warning to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 4. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, Paul says, Train yourselves for godliness. For while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way, as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. All those who ignored this warning and spent their lives trying to preserve their earthly beauty and strength to the neglect of the true welfare of their souls will on this day behold those made beautiful and strong by the grace and the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. Efforts have been made to describe this state, but I fear they all fall pathetically short of the reality. What is this beauty that we will have? The prophet Daniel, in trying to speak of it, said in Daniel chapter 12 and verse 3, Daniel 12, 3, and those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the sky above 
and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. We live in a unique age. We're able to see the beauty of things in space like never before. And when we see some of these pictures, they're just absolutely stunning. And there is a beauty to them that is just awesome. Well, here's Daniel saying that in that day, we will have a righteousness that gives to us a beauty that will shine like the stars forever and ever. Jesus himself declared in Matthew chapter 13 and verse 43, in Matthew 13, 43, then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let him hear. In this day, we're going to shine like the sun in the kingdom of our Father. That's the beautiness that we're going to have. And that beauty will give glory to the Lord Jesus Christ because we have it because of him. The Apostle Paul, by the Holy Spirit, Spirit laid it out this way. And these verses aren't usually thought of in this context, but they ought to be. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning in verse 41. There is one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars. For star differs from star in glory. So it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. In short then, beloved, you will possess a free spirit and also have an imperishable, glorious spiritual body that has been raised up by the almighty power of the living God. He will be glorified in that beauty that will be yours because of him. He'll also be glorified in the power and the ease and the swiftness which in which all this will be accomplished. It will be done by his power, as we read a moment ago, but it'll be done in the twinkling of an eye. There won't be any groaning and straining among the tombs and graves of the elect. No, he'll call us forth and we will come. There will be no pauses while the dust is fetched from every far-flung place or drawn up from the bottom of the sea. The Savior will overcome our death as easily as he did his own. The price has been paid in full, and, su and it's sufficient, and the grave cannot hold you. This world cannot hold you. All who believe in everything that they are, they are at his command. Everything that we are now and everything that we will ever be, we are totally at his command. And when he calls us, we will come. And the power and the ease and the swiftness with which that is done, the Lord Jesus Christ will be glorified in all of that. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 1 Corinthians 6 verse 14 and God raised the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. Easily, powerfully, quickly. The Lord himself, speaking through the prophet Isaiah, says this. And this is the prophecy of Isaiah chapter 43, verses 5 through 7. Isaiah 43, 5 through 7. Fear not, for I am with you. I will bring your offspring from the east, and from the west I will gather you. I will say to the north, give up, and to the south, do not withhold. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the end of the earth. 
everyone who is called by name, by my name, who I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. Now, the initial, of course, fulfillment of that has to do with the calling back of Israel to the land of promise. But that is a picture of this greater calling forth. And from wherever we are, we'll be called together powerfully, easily, and swiftly. In Isaiah 26, the chapter of uh, the 26th chapter of Isaiah, verse 19, it says, "Your dead shall lie, live; their bodies shall rise. You who dwell in the dust, awake and sing for joy, for your dew is the dew of light, and the earth will give birth to the dead." The dead in Christ, beloved, will rise with the same ease as Lazarus came forth. And it will be with blinding swiftness. One moment the bodies of the elect will be silent and sleeping in their graves. In the next, they will be with him in the air, glorifying his name before all. When you think of all the malice associated with persecution, the mutilations, and the horrific tortures, the horrible deaths. It's chilling. But now, on this great day, before all of those who perpetrated those crimes against God's people, those who turned theological degrees into death sentences or death warrants, they will stand before all of those whose visage they marred and abused and behold them in the glorious state Christ purchased for them on the cross. They will see them in not what we would call perfect health, but beyond that. They will see them in this beauty described here. And oh, the terror that will fall on those who did such things supposedly in the name of God. In Isaiah chapter 13, verse 13, the Lord says, Therefore I will make the heavens tremble, and the earth will be shaken out of its place at the wrath of the Lord of hosts in the day of his fierce anger. Suddenly, before all, will be this throng of saints glorified in the Lord Jesus Christ. And Christ will be glorified in them because all that he's promised is now theirs. And they will be a witness against all of those who have opposed him, opposed his gospel, tortured his saints. Jesus warns in John chapter 3, beginning in verse 35, John chapter 3, verse 35, Jesus says, The Father loves the Son, and has given all things into his hand. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. I think maybe it would be profitable if those two verses from John chapter 3 were as well known as John 3.16. Not to take anything away from John 3.16, but John 3.36 is a vital message. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. Jesus will be glorified also in the finality and eternity of all this. Unlike the stars that we see now that will melt in the coming of the, of the dissolution of the heavens, the saints will shine forever. In Matthew 13, verse 43, Jesus says there, Matthew 13, 43, Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let him hear. We already quoted that verse once, but it comes in to play again here in this context. <coughs> and then in what 
Paul says here in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 10, he goes on to say that even the elect themselves will marvel at what is theirs by faith in him. They'll be in a state of wonder and admiration. How did these things get to be ours? We'll be saying what we see in 1 John chapter 2, or excuse me, chapter 3, 1 John 3 and verse 1. See what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called the children of God. What manner of love is this that we, that we should be put in this place when you're staying there among that throng, when you're standing there in that beauty provided by the Lord Jesus Christ, when you've experienced the, the power and the ease of the change that has come over you, and you are now uh, fully enjoying the promises that he has made and provided for through his death on the cross, the thing we'll be saying is, see what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us. Look at what has come to us through Christ. And even in our marveling at that, Christ will be glorified. Ferguson says, the apostle adds that Christ, the judge, shall also be admired in them. That is, shall put such glory on them as never was expected, neither by themselves nor others. What Ferguson is saying is this will only be a shock to those who hated the gospel and hated the people of God. It'll be a shock to the people of God themselves as we actually see what Christ has prepared for us, what God has given us in him. It's not until this day is upon you that you and I will fully understand the words of Christ in John chapter 17. We read them often. Christ is praying, but we're never going to fully understand them until that day. Jesus said there in his great high priestly prayer to his father in John 17 verse 10, all mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. Then down in verse 20, he says, I do not ask for these only, the disciples who were there with him at the time, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. That's you, beloved. That they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you that they also may be in us, so that the world might believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one. All mine are yours, all yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. Though the glory of Christ the judge will be set forth to the admiration of all beholders, says Ferguson, in the pouring forth of his wrath and vengeance upon godless reprobates, his proud and obstinate enemies. Yet his glory will be incomparably more and more admired in his putting glory upon the elect insofar as the reprobate will receive but what they deserve. But as for the elect, besides the wonderful change which shall be brought in them, the glory put upon them shall be without, yea, and contrary to their deserving. I don't know if you caught what Ferguson is saying there, but he's saying, yes, Christ will be glorified, in the judgment that he brings upon those who don't know God and have not believed the gospel. He'll be glorified in carrying out his holy vengeance against them, but they will be getting what they deserve. He says, what will bring glory to Christ in regards to you and me is that we will not be getting what we deserve. But as we stand in that vast crowd, as we 
carry the beauty of Christ as we experience that swift, powerful change, as everything that's been promised to us in Christ becomes ours, as all that takes place, it will be clear that it's not anything that we have done, not anything that we deserve, but it's all because of his grace, because of his love, because of his sacrifice for our sins. And so he will be glorified in us because there we will be the undeserving saved by grace. On this glorious day, beloved, the Lord of hosts, Isaiah 28, 5 says, the Lord of hosts will be a crown of glory and a diadem of beauty to the remnant of his people. On that day, we'll be glorified in him and he will be glorified in us. If you know that you have no part in that day, in this beauty of that day, because you're without Christ, you have not obeyed the gospel, and you do not know God and have not wanted to know him, this is the day to repent of that unbelief, to come to Christ, and to find a part in all of this that is promised to the believer. To find Christ glorified in you because of the change he works in you by faith. I plead with you, don't die in your sins and have this day bearing down you on a day as a day of judgment. But confess your sins. Come to Christ for forgiveness and instead have this day standing over you as a day of the greatest and most blessed expectations, a day that is so full of glory that all the things that we've talked about tonight hardly bear any light on the fullness of what that day will bring for every believer. Let's pray. Father in heaven, for all of us who have hope in the Lord Jesus Christ, how can we thank you for this promise, for the hopes that we have of this day? How can we thank you for sending your son to die for us so that these things might be ours? What can we say about your love to us that we should be called the children of God, that we should have a real anticipation of being a part of that throng, of having that beauty, of, Lord, experiencing these things and, and, and they're being ours for all eternity. Oh, Father, receive our thanks. Receive our praise. Receive our glory. Lord, teach us to love you more. Father, if there's anyone who is without that hope, who has to look on this day as a day of judgment, judgment and vengeance, I pray, Lord, that even now you would have mercy on them, that you would press the truth of who Christ is and what he has done upon their hearts, and they would abandon their sin, seek to know you, the living God, believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, and, Father, enter into the joy of the kingdom of heaven forever. Lord, be merciful. Lord, work in their hearts. Give them no peace until they find peace in you alone. And now, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion and fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.